Welcome to another Read to Lead Live. I'm your host, Kamara Thompson from Read to Lead. As many of you know, Read to Lead helps you be the boss in virtual career exploration. As one of the pre-work for today's event, we asked you to play and do Just Breathe. In Just Breathe, you built relationships in order to make decisions. We'll be talking to our awesome guest today, John King Jr., how he used building relationships to get to his leadership roles today, how he was able to have an awesome career leadership journey. I am so excited to have John with us today. Before we get started, I just want to talk about some norms. Here at Be to Lead, we believe in positive vibes only. Please engage with us in the chat. If you have questions, go into the Q&A. We want to hear from you. Uh, if you love something that John has to say, please feel free to drop the mic, throw some snaps, clap, show some love, tell us, engage with us in the chat. We want to hear from you. This is a conversation, not just between John and I, but between all of us together. Okay, so uh, I'm so excited, like I said, to be talking to John King Jr. John King Jr. is the president and CEO of a nonprofit organization that seeks to identify and close educational opportunity and achievement gaps. He served as a U.S. Secretary of Education in the Obama administration. Prior to that role, King carried out the duties of Deputy Secretary overseeing policies and programs related to P-12 education, English learners, special education, innovation, and agency. King joined the department following his post as New York State Education Commissioner. John began his career as a high school social studies educator and middle school principal. John, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Excited to join you. Looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. So we ask all of our guests, tell us a fun fact about yourself that we may not know. Mm -hmm. Well, what my fun fact, my, my family um, added a dog to our family just, just before COVID started, a uh, golden doodle named Max, and uh, we've, we really enjoyed having Max. He, he's definitely been a great addition to our family. Oh, I love that. If you guys have pets that you also have, feel free to put their names into the chat. We want to know what kind of pets you guys have that are a part of your family. So, you know, we talked to a lot of middle school and high school age students. What did you want to be when you were a middle schooler? You know, I think I, I knew I wanted to maybe be a lawyer or a judge. That, that was that's what I was thinking in, in elementary and middle school. I liked TV shows about courtroom dramas. And so I think that that's what got me interested in the law. Love that. So then how did you transition into a career in education? Yeah, that, that was really a product of my life experience. When I was a kid, both my parents were educators. My, my mom was a teacher and school counselor, and my dad was a teacher and administrator. Uh, but they both passed away when I was little. Um, my mom passed away when I was eight, fourth grade. Uh, my dad uh, when I was 12. And during the period when it was just my dad and me, my dad was very sick with Alzheimer's. So home was very unstable and scary a lot of the time and the thing that saved me was school school was the one place that was safe and consistent and nurturing where i had just great teachers who um, made school a place where i could be a kid when i couldn't be a kid at home and so when i was in college you know still thinking that i might want to go into into being a lawyer i started volunteering in uh, after school programs and running summer camps for students in Boston. And I loved being able to try to do for other kids what teachers had done for me. And so decided to become a teacher and ended up being a teacher and principal and spending my life in education. Education is such a calling. And I love that story where you were like, man, I really want to give back and create those safe spaces for other students. Um, I would love for us to talk a little bit. I mean, eight and 12 are so young to lose, obviously, really important, parent, you know, your parents, really important adult figures in your life. How did you sort of overcome that adversity? And like, what challenges were you facing? And, you know, how did you find the strength to, to sort of carry on? It, it's incredibly difficult, you know, that the, the experiences in school were the thing that kept me going. I have to say, if I if I had not had the teachers that I did, I don't know how my life would have turned out. 
Um, but then after my dad passed, I moved around different family members, different schools, and I was angry as a teenager. And you know that happens a lot for young people who experience trauma at early ages, who have these really difficult things happen to them. You know, they, it can cause you to feel angry. And I was angry. I was angry at adults, angry at the world, and I got in a lot of trouble in high school and actually got kicked out of high school. I always tell people I'm the first United States Secretary of Education who had been kicked out of high school. Um, but I was very fortunate that folks didn't give up on me. You know, it would have been very easy, and this happens unfortunately to a lot of young people, um, where folks say, well, you know, here's an African-American Latino male family in crisis struggling in school, what chances he have? And, and folks could have given up on me, but instead, I was very blessed that teachers and a school counselor gave me a second chance and were willing to see me as more than just the sum of my mistakes. They were willing to have more hope for me than I really had for myself at the time. And their investment really made possible uh, the opportunity for me to, to become an educator and, and, and to have just the incredible career and, and blessings that I've had in life. I mean, what really resonated with me is when you said like they could see that you were past the sum of your mistakes. And I think oftentimes we we feel, especially as, as students, that our mistakes are defining us, but we are not our mistakes. This, those are actually just like learning situations that we're going through. I saw in the chat like a really inspirational thing uh, from Jennifer Paulus. Her class wanted to just let you know, I don't know if you were in the chat, but I wanted to just call it out because mm -hmm. it's so beautifully written. Uh, but her class really related to your early childhood story. And many of them said they were so proud of you as you stood by President Obama in a video they watched. And they want to be just like you. So that's so that's <laughs> inspirational awesome. and aspirational at the same time. I love that. Um, so, you know, we are a reading program. I would love to talk about uh, what books or authors do you like to read or have inspired you uh, in your career? Yeah. In your life? You know, I remember reading as a kid um, Down These Mean Streets by B.D. Thomas. And it was the first time that I read a book where I really saw myself, right? Because he was a um, Afro-Latino author and he was Puerto Rican. And my mom was Puerto Rican, my dad was African-American. And it was really powerful to read a book that I could relate to. And I re remember that really being a turning point in how I thought about reading. I always enjoyed reading, but there was something really special about having that opportunity to have um, mirrors in what I was reading. And I would say, you know, kids need, um, students, all of us need mirrors and windows, right? Windows into worlds beyond our own, but mirrors meaning opportunities to see ourselves reflected. And that's always been important to me. And, you know, I would say Toni Morrison was one of my favorite authors in high school and college. And I continue to look for um, books that that give me that opportunity to see myself reflected. But I also am a huge fan of nonfiction and biographies, love to read biographies of uh, presidents and political leaders. And uh, you see the Frederick Douglass biography behind me there. Uh, I just think there's a lot to learn from history. Of course, I was a social studies teacher, so I'm biased, but uh, that's definitely a place where I focus my reading. That is so funny that you mentioned the mirrors um, and windows. We often say our leadership team within Read to Lead, we often talk about why it's so important that we have diversity of characters, that students can really see themselves reflected and also see what is possible for them. One of the things that I know is something near and dear to your heart is the idea that students can be community activists and leaders. And we also have in our games like project-based learning where students take on a more activism, a socially responsible citizenship role. So I would love to talk a little bit more, more about your passion around the ways that our students can show up as leaders, as community activists. Yeah, hugely important. You know, I taught, um, in addition to social studies, civics. And I think it's really important for students to understand how government works and the ways that they can influence um, how our society is organized. And if you think about our history as a country, think about the crucial role that young people played in the civil rights movement, for example. 
um, young people who participated in lunch counter sit-ins who uh, were willing to put themselves and their safety at risk to be a part of protest and demand equal rights for African Americans. And so uh, today we need that youth activism. And you know, I was really inspired to see young people participate in the Black Lives Matter uh, marches and and rallies last summer after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and so many others. My daughters who are 15 and 17, uh, they were a part of that. And it was really powerful to see young people demanding more respect for civil rights and an end to these incidents of police violence. Um, but they were actually asking for more than that, really asking the country to reckon with our history around systemic racism. And that was really inspiring. I, I also think we desperately need young people involved in the effort to try to get our country to take serious action on climate. Uh, we're seeing the consequences, wildfires in the West, uh, these terrible hurricanes that are happening uh, more and more frequently and causing more and more damage, flooding in many parts of the country. We certainly see that in Maryland, where I live, where we have flooding regularly in many communities. We've got to take action on climate and move away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And young people can be a part of that. You know, I've talked to young people who are going to their school board and demanding that their school board move to electric buses instead of diesel buses. Young people who are asking their state legislature to invest in solar energy for schools. So we, we really need young people to be a part of taking action on what is a threat to really human existence. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love that. And, you know, when you're talking, it really makes me think education is, is such a crucial point right now. Um, you know, if you put back your former Secretary of Education hat on, what would be some of the, the, the advice that you would give for students as they're going back into in-person school might be, you know, feeling uneasy about their you know, safe spaces, you know, places that used to be safe, but, you know, who knows now, depending on what districts they're a part of, what states, what communities they live in. Um, do you have any sort of advice as our students are transitioning back to in-school and or might still be doing some virtual hybrid learning? Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, I want folks to be healthy and safe and to look out for the health and safety of their classmates, their teachers, and their families. So, you know, Whatever the policies of the district may be, making sure that you're wearing a mask because that's going to help uh, make people more safe. Uh, making sure that when you're able to get vaccinated, you know, for our kids who are 12 and over, if they can get vaccinated now, hopefully later this fall, younger students will be able to get vaccinated. We need folks to get vaccinated, just like we get vaccinated against measles and mumps and polio. We just Got to get vaccinated against COVID. Got to encourage folks in our in our families, our neighbors, our friends to get vaccinated. So, of course, all of that is is critical for safety. Then, in terms of learning, I think trying to find those opportunities to catch up on some of the learning that maybe didn't happen that last year because of all the disruptions. Trying to figure out what you're passionate about and digging in with teachers and peers into those subjects that you're passionate about, whether it's math or science labs or social studies, um, and, and trying to reconnect. You know, my, my younger daughter's a sophomore in high school. She's really looking forward to the track season. Um, it's important for students to figure out what's the thing that they love doing that can be a part of their school experience. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's theater, maybe it's chess or robotics, but figuring out what, what's that thing that, that you're excited about and that you can participate in with your peers at school. I'm glad that you brought up passion because we actually have a question from a student around passion. What advice do you have for young people trying to find their passion? Hmm. A couple things. One is try, try lots of things, right? And, you know, if, if you think you might be interested in Model United Nations, go to the first meeting. If you think um, you might be interested in um, participating in, in uh, you know, a career and technical education program like pre-engineering or, or welding, try it out. You know, look for those opportunities. Um, find adults who are passionate about things that you're interested in and ask them their story, how they, how they discover 
that activity? What do they love about it? What's hard about it? You know, folks are eager, I think, to share when they're passionate about a thing. And so, you know, if you're interested in math, ask your math teacher. How'd you get interested in math? Did you like math when you were in middle school? How'd you decide to become a math teacher? And folks, are, folks will tell you more, more than you might imagine, and that will help shape some of your choices too. I love that. So don't be afraid to try and absolutely talk to other adults, maybe some of your friends, your peers, things that they're passionate mm -hmm. about. But have those conversations, right? Be inquisitive, um, have that curiosity to learn and just to try. There's nothing wrong with trying everything if you can and whatever sticks, mm -hmm. whatever you love, you know, go after that. Um, so that kind of reminds me, what did, were you in extracurricular activities when you were in high school or in college? What did you, what were you passionate about? Yeah, you know, I, um, I loved, theater actually and did and did a lot of theater both um sometimes being on the stage but a lot of times that the kind of behind the scenes yeah. uh, work um that that was definitely a big part of my high school experience um uh in the high schools that i was in we had kind of a african-american and latino student organization i always participated in those that was an important part of my high school experience uh, Spanish club always looking for opportunities to work on on my Spanish. Um, so those are a few. Those were a few of those things. I I ran track a little bit, but I was quite quite slow. So, <laughs> but at least you tried. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least you were out there yeah. trying, yeah. <laughs> which is great. Okay, so let's go to some student questions. Darius wants to know what was it like working for President Obama or working with President Obama. I mean, it was, it was amazing, I mean, as, as you might imagine, you know, both President Obama and Mrs. Obama care very deeply about schools and education, um, particularly committed to trying to make sure that all students, you know, regardless of race or income, have access to opportunity. And so uh, it's great to work for someone with whom you have those kind of shared values. Uh, they're also both incredibly nice and uh, incredibly smart. And, you know, the president would always come into meetings being extraordinarily well prepared. Uh, having read all the material, he would ask the toughest uh, questions in meetings. Um, but he was always trying to figure out what could we do in government to help make people's lives better. And, you know, I think that that's, that's how it should be. That, that's what you want leaders to, to be doing. I love that. And then uh, a little follow-up question from Caden: Was it fun working with the Obamas? It, it was. <laughs> it, was story to tell. it was very fun, and and they uh, one of the things they really love is music, uh, and so there were there were some great uh, concert experiences at the White House. There were you know these small small concerts with just you know folks in the administration. I remember one uh, performance with Diana Ross that was amazing to be in a room with you know, maybe there were 100 people and Diana Ross was just doing a special performance, you know, and uh, that kind of celebration of the arts uh, and music in particular was really important to the president and, and to Mrs. Obama. Oh my God, I'm jealous. I've seen Diana, she's amazing <laughs> in concert, but just to be in an intimate setting with her must have just been spectacular. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> um, so, you know, this is so funny. A student asked, like, what's a CEO? And I realized, like, in my world, I've never had to define that. And I'm like, oh, my God, that makes sense. Like, students may not understand. What is a CEO? Could you explain a little bit more? Yes. So CEO stands for Chief Executive Officer. And what that means, usually in a in a organization, is that's the person who's ultimately responsible for making sure the organization accomplishes its mission. Uh, that's the the, the person in charge and and where the where the buck stops when it comes to decision making in the organization. So I'm the, the CEO for a nonprofit organization, uh, organization that exists really to have good impact in the world. And we're focused on educational opportunity for students of color and students from low income backgrounds. Um, and speaking of what is the most challenging job that you've ever had in your career? Or in your life? Mm, mm. I would say being a first year teacher. Because, um, you know, after after you've 
taught a few years, you know, you have your materials and you kind of know how things work in the classroom and you're more comfortable. First year teaching, you know, every day is this totally new experience and um, it's a lot of work. It's incredibly satisfying, but uh, that was definitely the hardest. That, you know, when you say that, I think my mine would be my first year of teaching as well. I taught mm -hmm. in an urban environment just like you did, and <laughs> it has such amazing highs, but, you know, you can sometimes go home like, am I in the right place? <laughs> this is so mm -hmm. challenging, but, you know, you go through it because we have a passion and a love to, to give back to our students. So speaking of, what is one of the more rewarding experiences that you've had in education? Mm. You know, two, two things come to mind. One is I really love being a principal. I think principals really are uniquely positioned to set the tone for the school and create a school culture that is positive and supportive of teachers and students. And, um, you know, I'm still in touch with, with students that I uh, worked with as a teacher and principal. And one of the students who was in my middle school when I was a principal, she now is uh, in the Massachusetts State Legislature. Uh, and I'm so proud of her, China Tyler. And um, it's just, it's really satisfying to, to, to know that as an educator, you've helped contribute to someone, you know, making uh, such, a, such a wonderful journey, professional journey. Uh, so that's one. And then when I was secretary, one of the things I worked on was uh, a project to make sure that folks who are incarcerated are able to access college. And uh, in the 90s, Congress passed a law that was um, terrible in a lot of ways that caused a lot of our uh, challenges in our criminal justice system. And one of the things that they did in that law was they prevented folks who were incarcerated from accessing uh, federal assistance for higher education, a program called the Pell Grant Program. And we thought this was wrong. Uh, and so in the Obama administration, we created a project, a pilot project, to allow 65 colleges and universities to work with prisons to make sure that folks could pursue college education. And when you visit the programs, it's so inspiring because um, folks really use education to change the whole trajectory of their lives. And for some folks, it's the first time that they've really had educational experiences that were positive. Um, and we, we worked to launch that program. And then at the Education Trust, the organization I lead now, we've worked to try to change the law. And finally, last December, Congress changed the law. And so now um, folks in, in prisons all across the country are gonna be able to use federal assistance to pursue college. And I'm really proud of that work. That is amazing. Um, I saw you in the chat, someone was like, let's shout out all educators. Let's do some mm -hmm. snaps for all of our educators That's right, that's there. right. <laughs> um, so Khalees would like to know, do you have some tips on overcoming rejection and not getting discouraged? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of things. One is, you know, it's really important to have your kind of community of support and to figure out who are the people who you trust to give you advice, to give you honest feedback, folks who, who uh, will give you unconditional love and they are your fans and champions, um, but also have your best interests at heart. And, and it's important to identify those people. And if you haven't found those mentors outside of your family to really think about, is there a teacher? Is there someone in the after school program? Is there a college counselor? Is there someone who I wanna try to develop as as a as a mentor it's important to find those people at every stage of your education and career those folks can be really helpful in helping you learn from things that don't go right times that you fail times that things are hard and can really be a sounding board as you try to figure out um, what to take away from that experience so that you can be successful the next time uh, the other thing i would say is uh, hard work and perseverance goes a long way, right? And, and coming away from an experience where you didn't have the success you wanted and working really hard at improving, learning, uh, 
asking for help so that the next time you're able to achieve your goal. And Alexander would like to know, at what time in your life did you think to yourself, it's time to follow my dreams? Mm, mm, uh, oh, that's such an interesting question. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm running for governor of Maryland. And, you know, the decision to run for office uh, is a hard one because it's a big commitment personally and for your family. Um, and uh, I just really felt like I want to try to make as much impact as possible. And I've um, been blessed to have worked for President Obama to have really learned how, to, how government works. And I think I can contribute as governor here in Maryland. And so decided to do that. Uh, and I hope that some of, the, some of the students will decide to run for office, whether that's run for mayor or city council or the state legislature or governor or senator or president. But we, we need uh, civic participation. Uh, and we need folks who will step up and try to be of service to the community. And I'll just add my two cents and say that we definitely need that from um, from various voices, right? So from people from all communities, all walks of life, mm -hmm. we want to hear from all of you all. You can all be leaders in your community, and you can all figure out different ways that you can become leaders within your community. So that's awesome. I love that you said that. We have a great question as well. If you could wave a wand and create your perfect school, what would mm -hmm. it be like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. It would be fun, right? I mean, learning is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be work, right? But it's also supposed to be fun. And, and you know, when I was a principal, one of the things I would often talk with teachers about is, you know, what do you want kids to say when they get off the bus after the first day of class? And I always think what you want is for kids to get off the bus and say, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about Ms. Thompson's class. I, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do these science experiments. We're going to read these amazing books. She told us about this one author that inspired her, and we're going to read that book. You, you want that level of excitement and enthusiasm. And, I, and so for me, uh, schools need to, and there's a lot of things schools need to do. We got to make sure kids have. English skills and math skills and science and social studies. We've got to expose them to art and music and have good physical education programs. We've got to build strong relationships between teachers and students and among students. We've got to uh, teach lessons about, um, about life and life skills. There's a lot that has to happen in, in a school community, but ultimately the joy of learning should be at the heart. And that was really important to me as a teacher and principal. And, and, I, and I hope something that uh, as educators, we can always try to cultivate. I love that, the joy of learning. I think that talks to and speaks to creating lifelong learners. Um, mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about how you're still learning? I mean, some, some students might think, man, you know, John's at the pinnacle of his career. Mr. King is doing his thing. Is there more for him to, to learn? Is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm always learning and always, always trying to learn more. Um, uh, two examples of that. One, uh, as I'm involved in this campaign, it's meant traveling all over the state of Maryland and spending time talking to people about their challenges and hopes and uh, folks in rural communities that are very different from the more urban communities that I that I grew up in. Uh, folks who are, um, you know, living uh, right on the water, who are seeing the, the impact of climate change every day. Um, and so I've really learned a lot about different folks experiences and also different areas of government, transportation, housing, health care. And that's been super fun and, and, and really gratifying. The other thing I've mentioned around continuous learning, so I'm talking to you from Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, I live about 25 miles from where my great grandfather was enslaved in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And turns out that the property where my great grandfather was enslaved is owned by the family that are descendants of the family that owned my family, that enslaved my family. They've stayed on that property for many generations. And I've gotten to know them. 
and we become friends and I've spent time on the on the property and the property is actually maintained just as it was in 1860 same main house that was built in the 1700s and the cabin that my great grandfather lived in with his family as enslaved people still standing on the property and so we've had the opportunity to spend time inside that cabin and to really learn about our family history um, in ways that a lot of African-American families don't get to, right? I mean, we, we have a, such a deep understanding of the, the trajectory of our family. Uh, and we've also gotten to have a lot of deep conversations uh, with the family that lives there about the institution of slavery and about their ancestors and you know one of their ancestors a couple of their ancestors served in the confederate army and so we've had conversations about that and you know that kind of learning about our history but also trying to build understanding across lines of race i think is really important for the health of our of our country and our democracy what you're really describing is a is a healing relationship um I'm over here, honestly, as a Black American woman getting chills. So thank you for sharing that story. This is obviously not what Retweet Live is actually about, but it's so important about you know the the stories that are going on. Um, speaking of, uh, students want to know: Do you have a mentor um, who's helping guide John King Jr. through his journey? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been very fortunate to have to have uh, a number of important mentors. Um, two, I'll mention some my when I mentioned how I got kicked out of high school, and when I did, I went actually to live with my aunt and uncle. My uncle um, had been a Tuskegee Airman, one of the first African American pilots in the U.S. military, and then spent a career in the Air Force. And my uncle really played an important role in my life because he really pushed me to see, as as he said neither he nor I could do anything about the things that had happened to me as a kid and what I had gone through with losing my parents. But he really stressed me, it was up to me to decide what I was going to make of my life, that I had to take responsibility for the choices I was making. And that was a really powerful pivot point in my life. And, and I'm very grateful to him for his advice and support. He's, he's since passed away, but um, just was a wonderful, wonderful presence in my life. You know, someone now who's who's a mentor, I feel very fortunate that I can uh, call on President Obama for advice uh, about uh, politics and life. He has two daughters who are a little bit older than my two daughters, so I can also call him for advice around uh, around um, parenting. We always talk, end up talking about our daughters. So, uh, that's a, a blessing. That is a blessing. I love that. Um, so Yamir would like to know what ultimately has inspired you to do all the things that you've accomplished thus far. Mm. You know, really gratitude for the people who who helped me. You know, I had this amazing teacher in fourth, fifth, sixth grade. He was my teacher when my mom passed and through much of the time that I was living with my dad. His name is, is Mr. Osterweil. And his class was amazing. Uh, we read the New York Times every day, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. We did productions of Shakespeare, A Midsummer Night's Dream. We did a production of Alice in Wonderland. Uh, I was the rose in Alice in Wonderland with like big red felt petals sticking out of my head, right? And I remember the things in his class like it was yesterday because it was such a powerful experience. And I felt so cared for challenged. I mean, he, he really pushed us, you know, you'd finish a book, he'd have another one in hand, you know, that was a little more challenging. Uh, but I, I learned so much from him. And I'm so grateful to him. And when I was sworn in as secretary, um, he came, I invited him to come to the swearing in, and just to be able to thank him for the difference he made in my life. And so, you know, what inspires me every day is knowing that we educators can have such a powerful impact on, on kids' lives and folks save my life. And I just want to give a little bit of that back to other young people. 
think that sense of gratitude absolutely comes out in your in your work um, and in having this conversation. I could keep going on and on <laughs> and talking to you even more. Unfortunately, we do have to wrap up. So one of our last questions is, what would you tell your 10-year-old self? Mm. You know, when I was 10, it's when I was living with my dad and I was um, really sad a lot of the time and, and scared and sometimes not very hopeful. And I think the thing that I needed to hear and I heard at school um, was hope about a better future, right? And, and that sense that it can be better, that it will be better. And, you know, if, if my 10 year old self could have seen the life that, that I've been able to have, the opportunities I've had professionally, but just, you know, my wife and my daughters and the, the family that, that we've been able to build, like, I, I don't know that I would have believed it when I was 10, but, but I'm glad that there were teachers who at least planted the seed for me that it could be better and that I could have something different. And so I hope that even when things are hard, even when things in life are challenging, that young people can find uh, mentors, teachers, folks in their lives will give them the sense that there is a there is a better future that is possible and help them get there. John, this has been such an inspirational conversation. I know that I want to just thank you, A, for being open, honest, vulnerable, sharing such incredibly powerful stories. I love the sense of gratitude that totally comes out in the work that you do and the ways that you're thinking about the work, the passion. Good luck on your campaign. And I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to talking to our students across the country as they're navigating this world, as they're thinking through their passions, as they're thinking about ways that they can show up as leaders and know that tomorrow is always going to be better than today. You guys are going to have an amazing life. Thank you guys so much for being a part of Read to Lead Live. We'll catch you next time. And John, again, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks so much.